Our next speaker is uh, Professor Daniel Gigax. And uh, just to be very open, I, he has been my PhD student. So if you want to accuse me of nepotism, <laughs> you have all the information you need. Uh, Professor Gigax is uh, actually active at the Technical University, or I don't know exactly how it's called today, before it was Technicum. Is it Technical University? It's University of Applied Sciences. Ah, even better. <coughs> uh, in, uh, in the canton of Basel-Land. And he, after his PhD, he has been one and a half year with uh, Professor Weizsäid at Harvard. And then he came back to Sibagaidi. And finally he ended there in this uh, university. I wish him good luck for a nice conference. Thank you very much, Jakob for these uh, nice words. And I would also like to thank for the invitation uh, to have the opportunity to talk to you today here. It's a great honor for me to be here. Uh, when I uh, got uh, this uh, uh, theme, the title, I thought, well, that's a lot to do within 45 minutes. But it gives me also the opportunity to focus a little bit on these uh, items I think are important to discuss here. Uh, I would like to structure my presentation into three parts. First part is uh, dedicated to how we organize R&D in a industrial environment. And the second part will then be uh, a little bit more discussing the scientific basis of my research. And the third part are examples of applications, and then I come to a conclusion, hopefully also addressing the impact of my work uh, on molecular biology. So, we heard this morning what is past is a prologue, and that is also true with respect to my research. So there are some role models which were very important for my research. And the first important model was Jakob Niesch. As a student, I attended one of his uh, lectures on antibiotics and the biosynthesis of antibiotics. And I was very much fascinated how scientists at that time were able to manipulate microorganisms in order to increase titers of secondary metabolites. So this interest actually led into a PhD thesis, as you already mentioned. And the tutor of my thesis was Oreste Gisalba, he is also here and became a friend of mine, and probably he is still Mr. Biotech here in Switzerland. A second role model, you already mentioned it, was George Whitesides. Uh, very interesting professor at Harvard University already at that time. And, uh, well, uh, he's a chemist, and I was a biochemist, so I decided to go as a biochemist in a chemical environment. But he was using enzymes in organic synthesis. And enzymes as biological macromolecules also attracted my interest very, very much. So he also had an influence on my later research. And to bring that a little bit Together, I'm working in biotechnology, and I think it's time to bring up a definition. What is biotechnology? It is generally accepted as the use of living systems or parts thereof to develop or make useful products. And now I'd like to put that a little bit in a greater perspective. 
That means, uh, where am I? Where do I research nowadays? So at the bottom is my research group, which is part of the University uh, of Life Sciences at the University of Applied Sciences of Northwestern Switzerland. But we also belong to the Biotechnet Switzerland, which is actually a R&D consortium which was established by the CTI, the Commission of Technology and Innovation, and I'm going to discuss that a little bit in more depth later on. And a couple of weeks ago, we just heard that we are now one of the eight new national thematic networks in Switzerland, which uh, were inaugurated by the CTI. So Swiss Biotech will be one of these new networks. And Swiss Biotech is constituted out of the Biotech Net Switzerland and the SBA, which is the Swiss Biotech Association. So an association which represents approximately 200 companies in Switzerland. So we hope that we really can push forward uh, biotechnology technology even more. Now, biotechnology is a crossover technology, as you can see, and it is comparable to other uh, uh, technologies like nanotechnology or information technology. So it inspires or influences pharma, diagnostics, agro, nutrition, we heard it, just medicinal engineering and chemistry. And a couple of years ago, an interesting person, actually also a physicist, uh, made a statement, Freeman Dyson. Uh, he uh, told us, I see a bright future for the biotechnology industry when it follows the path of the computer industry, becoming small and domesticated rather than big and centralized. Now, at that time, it was kind of a provocation. But let's see what they have achieved in between. I give you two examples. On the light, uh, uh, left side, I come back to white sides. So he came up with patterned paper as a platform for inexpensive, low-volume, portable bioassays. This is a wonderful example. Number two, on the right side, a new diagnosticum connected actually to an iPhone. It is called IBG Star, which is a glucose meter uh, produced by Sanofi. So everybody, every diabetic, is able actually to measure the sugar at home and can collect data and even transfer the data to his doctor. So we are in this direction of miniaturization uh, of biotechnology. Now let me come to the Biotechnet Switzerland as a R&D consortium which was supported by the CTI or is still supported up to the end of this year. So actually the Biotechnet is a registered association it was founded in 2001. It's, as I said, officially supported by the CTI. Uh, we have ordinary members, associated members, an executive board, advisory board, and we also have a mission. And the mission is to build excellent project consortia for innovative R&D projects, education, and knowledge transfer. And to align technologies and competences with marked needs. So we work in this industrial environment. You see the ordinary members uh, written here. CSCM, uh, HSSO Fribourg, and SCRM Uni Zürich are our newest, our latest members. One of our core uh, organization entity is certainly the platforms. And we try to organize the platforms around 
themes. For example, 3CD culture, biosynthesis, miniaturized systems, molecular pharmacology and diagnostics, single-use devices, and chemistry. Where are we active? We are active, as I mentioned, in the R&D support. You can see here three projects we worked on. I'm not sure whether Markus Grütter is still here. He was here this Oh, yeah, he's still here. So the first project, actually, we did together with him, Martin Siever, who was here this morning, and Roche. It was a very, very uh, difficult project, uh, the uh, production of membrane uh, receptors. Then we had projects in the field of enzymatic transesterification in automation. Continuing education means that we come together to summer schools, etc and courses and seminars, I just would like to touch on one activity uh, which we made together with Roche in Basel. When they actually built their Avestin production, they had a need for new uh, technician, technicians in the production. And actually, we educated a lot of so-called chemicants and made out of them biocants who were able actually to, do the, the, to work in the production there. Now, what are the current projects? And I have here a list of projects. I don't go through this list, but I would like to draw your attention to, for example, here the companies which are involved in these uh, projects. All these uh, uh, colored companies are actually startup companies coming from University of Applied Sciences from the ETH or other universities in Switzerland. This is also very interesting to see that a lot of partners now we are working together are startups coming from the universities. So there must be a reason for that. The other interesting issue is that of these projects, six projects are in the area of drug discovery. Three are in the area of medtech, four are in the area of engineering, and only one is in the area of diagnostics. This gives you a little bit uh, a flavor how broad the projects are we are working on. Here are some key figures over a period of more than 10 years. So within this network, we worked on more than 55 projects, the turnover of the project was more than 47 million Swiss francs. The industry share was 55%. The CTI share was 45%. The turnover per project was roughly 4 million per year. The turnover per project was, uh, with respect, was 0.9 million. The largest was 2 million. The smallest was 0.1 million. The average project time was about two years, and the number of employees based on FTEs, if you count all together, was more than 250 who were working on all these projects. So now I would like to move on and uh, show you how somebody from industry sees an ideal collaboration between universities and the industry. Number one, Fast, short distances of communication and delivery. Often the companies we are working with are in the area of Basel, for example, so we have really short distances and it is very easy to communicate. Lump fees per month, year or project. So no bureaucratic uh, hurdles. So uh, they would like to have very easy access to come in and also to exit again. GMP or GLP know-how available at research organization. This is a hard uh, task, actually, because, uh, well, one or the other lab has an ISO certification, but normally we are not running our research on the GMP or GLP. Scale-up and services according to SOPs. So, of course, yeah, because of the reproducibility, etc., of the results, 
we should adhere to SOPs. Access to sophisticated technologies, including technical support, this actually is a strength of our organization. We do have very high sophisticated technologies. Inclusion of additional disciplines available at the research organization. So they would like to uh, work not only with the bioanalytics, but also with the chemistry. And mutual complementation of know-how and technologies. So what we are able to do, they don't have to do. And the last point, an excellent fit with respect to cultural and ethical values. So uh, let me summary that in a nutshell, the BiotechNet 3 products are reliable R&D support, custom-made education, and well and fittingly trained scientists. Now I go back a little bit to the research I'm doing in my group and what we try to do to be able to work in this uh, industrial environment is to bring together uh, competencies. So it is a combination of different competencies. First one, I already mentioned it, the technological foundation, which is extremely important. So we have access to biospecific interaction analysis. We have access to enzyme immunoassay techniques. We have in, uh, access to uh, techniques for biomarker identification. And of course, we also have access to cloning and gene expression methods. Normally, we group our competence in a kind of a platform. Uh, we call it interdisciplinary innovation platform here shown as an example uh, in in vitro diagnostics. So the partners are School of Life Sciences. We are responsible for the research and development. In this particular case, we have the clinical chemistry from the University Hospital of Basel on board. And of course, uh, the industry partner, Bühlmann Laboratories, uh, AG in Schönenbuch, who was responsible for the production and the sale of the kits we were actually uh, developing together. Another platform is the platform for drug discovery. Here we have a project uh, with the following members. Uh, Gisbert Schneider, he's professor here at ETH uh, in the Institute of Pharmaceutical Sciences then the Clinical Pharmacology and Toxicology from the University Hospital in Basel. Again, we of the School of Life Sciences. And the company is a very small new startup company, Allocyte Pharmaceuticals. And the third platform is uh, dedicated to molecular biotechnology. So we are able actually to produce proteins which we need for diagnostics or for uh, therapeutic applications with various expression systems we have at hand. The project in my group are a little bit phased, so we have projects in the early development. And uh, we have projects in the late development, and these are the projects which actually are products right now which were launched during the last couple of years. Deliverables we have, we try to make patents if necessary. Also, I see now that there is a, a, a switch in mentality. Companies, especially small companies, do not want to make patents right down. So what I do is they want to keep the processes secret as long as possible. Because patents, uh, the maintenance is very expensive. What we have as an, a further deliverable is uh, a report. Analytics uh, is, uh, is virtual if you want. The only thing you have are data and you have to bring the data together and to provide it to the industrial partner. And of course, the product. And this is one of the products which is right now on the market. I'm going to discuss this a little bit in more detail. And 
supporting the product, uh, also we make publications. Now, let's switch to this scientific foundation, which uh, we use actually in order to do the research, to develop new assays, new kits, etc. So, uh, the common denominator is the non-covalent interaction. And the question is, how can you use a non-covalent interaction in applications? And these interactions are used to determine analyte concentrations, are important to characterize binding properties. We heard it this morning uh, when we saw the antibodies uh, uh, binding to targets. And uh, we also need them to select targets or biologically active compounds. So it's worth to spend a few thoughts about this process of binding. Process of binding is often uh, explained as a lock and key situation. Or if you go a little bit further, you see it in this animation. Actually, it is often a very dynamic situation that after or upon uh, binding of a ligand to a protein, it may even change the configuration and the uh, binding performance may be even strengthened by that. So the binding process, process itself requires functional groups. It is based normally on weak interactions and can be explained for example, a little bit more sophisticated by the hand and glove fit, uh, and always reacts or almost always react, uh, results in an equilibrium situation. And this equilibrium situation can be formalized, as you can see here, and it ends, for example, with this uh, KD value, which is actually a measure of how tight a ligand binds to a receptor. We call it also affinity. The smaller the KD, the tighter the binding. But the crucial thing is that this uh, uh, equilibrium very much depends on pH, it depends on the temperature, the buffer, the salt and solvents. So you have to be very careful if you establish such affinities in vitro. And it has the unit of concentration what makes it comparable to the KM value, which we know very well from, enzyme, uh, from the enzyme kinetics. Here you have a table showing some calculated K of values for binary complexes. It is very interesting to see, for example, desferioxamine and iron has a very, very low KD. Avidin biotin has also a very low uh, uh, KD. If you translate that in complex stability, it is 80 days. And if you go down, you end up with enzymes, and per definition, these enzymes should have uh, higher KDs and also smaller uh, complex stabilities. The importance of the complex and its stability is shown on this slide here. It goes back to a work I was involved when I was in Novartis. It shows you a humanized monoclonal antibody which actually binds to IgE. This monoclonal antibody, Xolair, it was also, uh, you have seen it already this morning on a, on a slide, is a therapeutic against asthma and rhinitis. And obviously, this complex stability somehow uh, uh, depends or reflects the biological effect. The more stable, the complex, the longer is the duration of the effect. And this is shown here in this graph. So we have change of free IgE, this is the target, which has to be neutralized against uh, the dose of the therapeutic and the reduction of the symptoms. And you can easily see that the highest dose have 
a very nice reduction of free serum IgE, more than 85%, and it also so shows the best clinical symptoms. So this is a very nice relationship. What you can measure in vitro is also reflected in vivo. Now let me come to two uh, examples. One is a collaboration together with Bioversis, which is actually also a startup company coming out of the ETH, and the ZHW in Wadenswil. Our task uh, is to do the binding studies, but the, the, the project is actually the identification of inhibitors to silence tetracycline resistance. Uh, tetracycline uh, enters the bacterial cell. If it is not available in the cell, you see the tetracycline receptor which binds to the TET operator, preventing actually the synthesis of the tetracycline receptor and also the synthesis of TET-A, which is the tetracycline efflux protein and antiporter. That means as soon as tetracycline is available in the cell, it binds to the, to the receptor. The receptor actually is displaced from the DNA and TET-A is produced and the tetracycline is again uh, uh, released out of the cell. So this is the mechanism of, of this tetracycline. Now the question is, how can you model that uh, in vitro? And we use for these in investigations either BioCore or FortiBio. These are bio sensors, sensors which allows us actually to study the binding process in real time. So we can see the binding, we can also see the degradation of the complex again. This uh, BioCore consists of three modules. You have here the sensor itself on which you can immobilize then a protein which binds a link. You have a microfluidic system uh, which allows you to pump the analyte uh, through the system and you have the expert and control system to uh, evaluate, evaluate uh, and record the data. So in an animation, it looks like this. All the analytes uh, flow over the receptors or the proteins are able to bind. At steady state, actually, you switch from analyte to buffer and then you destroy the complex again, which is now, and you have the dissociation phase. So you have t the two different phases, uh, which allows you really to see the binding process but also the, the destruction of the complex. And this is unique. Normally you can't do that with other methods. But coming back to what I have said before, it is important to measure the complex stability. And you see now that with this method, we can measure the dissociation constant and the dissociation constant reflects actually the complex stability. So we have access to a parameter which is, uh, from the point of view of biology, very important. Now, how did we model the tetracycline resistance uh, silencing on this biosensor? And here you see the setup. We didn't have uh, the DNA. We had the analog, an oligonucleotide, and uh, the tetracycline receptor is able to bind to the specific sequence here. And then either you put tetracycline or add tetracycline. If you add tetracycline, then immediately, actually, uh, the whole complex is released from the oligo. On the other hand, and this is now the invention of this company, that they uh, synthesized additional small organic compounds which are also able to bind to this tetracycline receptor. And in this particular case, the complex is stabilized. It does not anymore, or it, it doesn't get anymore destroyed. So 
you actually, actually can uh, overcome the resistance. This shows you the relationship. So we have complex stability on the y-axis, and we have the tetracycline concentration of, on the x-axis. And the higher the tetracycline concentration is, uh, the more the complex gets destabilized uh, until everybody is away uh, from the DNA. This was the experimental setup to study the influence. And what is interesting is actually that you end up with three different types uh, of situations. Here you have the tetracycline receptor with the tetracycline bound and the silencer bound. Here you have only uh, the, the, tetracycline, the tetracycline receptor, and here you have tetracycline receptor uh, with another silencer. And you end up with three different re results. And what does it mean? First, silencer prevents dissociation of TET-R from the operator. Also, tetracycline is present. This is this uh, dark uh, sensorgram, violet sensorgram. TET-R dissociates from the operator in the presence of tetracycline. That is the light blue sensor, sensorgram. And the last one is the silencer, which prevents TET-R from binding to the operator, the light violet sensorgram, which is more or less by itself an antibiotic. So we can study in vitro actually what, is, what the, uh, the chemists and the biologists would like to have uh, realized then in the in vivo situation. So these complements very much uh, uh, experiments done in, on the cellular ever level or with animals or in vivo. The next uh, project is related to screening of the day rate, rape drug GHB, gamma hydroxy butyric acid. This is a so-called club drug. It is a very potent central nervous system depressant, produces extreme relaxation and mental confusion, is extremely popular with sexual predators. The victim has difficulty remembering actually what occurred and is used as a general anesthetic. It improves continuity of sleep in narcolepsy. Actually, the idea of this uh, project came out of the University Hospital in Basel, and uh, we actually do it together with, uh, or did it together with the University Hospital in Basel, uh, Bühlmann Laboratories, uh, and our university. The estimation of GHB intoxication in Switzerland is shown here. You see a steadily increase uh, since uh, roughly 10 years. Uh, since 2000, in the U.S., 16,000 cases of GHB intoxication were reported, 70 deaths even, and, but the dark figure is very, very high. So what is GHB? GHB, I mentioned it, is gamma-hydroxybutyric acid. It is a small fatty, uh, uh, a small chain fatty acid, naturally present in central nervous system, and peripheral tissues. It is important or plays an important role in synaptic transmission. GHB serves as both a precursor and a degradation product of gamma aminobutyric acid and is chemically synthesized from GBL. And this is a little bit uh, astonishing. So the metabolism of GBH is shown here. It is this molecule, and normally it is oxidized to succinimic semialdehyde and then further oxidized to, uh, to succinic acid, which is part of uh, the Krebs cycle. So the compound itself is very heavily metabolized in the organism. But what you can see is uh, that 
compounds like gamma butyrolactone are very easily transformed chemically into the gamma hydroxybutyric acid. This compound actually is illegal, but the others are not illegal, but are present, and I can't, maybe you can read it, are used uh, in industry nowadays. And so the GBL is an industry product, and the other one, the 1,4 butane diol, is also an industrial product. Both are very easily translated or uh, chemically into gamma hydro hydroxybutyric acid. When we start such a project, we have a look at the structure and ask ourselves, how can we measure it? We normally go for enzymes or for antibodies. And in this particular case, the enzyme was the method of choice, who leads us exactly to this succinimic acid semialdehyde. It is a uh, oxidoreductase, which is needed, and uh, you actually reduce the NAD to NADH. The enzyme we found in a bacterium in Ralstonia eutropha. It has a molecular mass of roughly 40,000. The assay is actually very simple, so what we monitor is the increase in NADH, depending on the concentration of the GHB at 340 nanometers. So we have established an integrated assay development, and that brings me again back to the question of, of the symposium also. Is uh, molecular biology important? Of course it is important. Whatever we do, uh, it starts uh, with molecular biology. Either we uh, isolate it from a, a natural uh, organism or we synthesize it and we end up then with synthetic DNA. We bring it normally in, in an E. coli and purify it, uh, also express it, purify it, and based on or with the purified enzyme, we actually do uh, the kinetics. We try to characterize it also in terms of kinetics. The assay performance is shown here. So in urine, the normal values are around 10 milligrams per liter. In serum, it is uh, about 4 milligrams per liter. So the cutoff, we set at 15 milligrams per liter. And the enzymatic uh, assay we have now available actually showed very good performance uh, when we compare it with results uh, collected by GCMS. The standard curve is in the range of 10 to 1,000 milligrams per liter. The working range is between 5 and 200 milligrams. We have an analytical sensitivity of roughly 1 milligram, and the precision is better than 10%. And the product of all these investigations are shown here, it is this test kit, which is in between on the market and is run on several, to, several apparatus av available at the university hospitals. The company uh, already gained some revenues from this test kit, and what you can see is the increase of the revenues within the last three or four years. But the story goes on. Half a year ago, uh, we saw a headline in the newspaper, two people are in a coma, intensive care after drinking a mixture of liquid ecstasy and alcohol at a private party. That happens often, even uh, more often. And uh, we thought, would it be possible actually to measure the GHB also in alcoholic drinks? And you see here one of these uh, drinks, it's a Caipirinha recipe. And uh, you have sugar in it, but you have also this uh, Sasha in it, 38, 40% of alcohol. And the question is, is it possible with our test actually also to trace then the GHB in an alcoholic drink? Because you have a lot of alcohol in this drink. And the dehydrogenase we have 
is an alcohol dehydrogenase. So the challenges of this project will be the selectivity of our enzyme, but also the miniaturization. Because if you go into a bar, you will not only become one straw, but two straws. And on one straw, you probably would have a, sh a short, button-sized enzyme sensor, which would be able to detect uh, uh, whether there is GHB available or not. So this brings me to the conclusion. The impact of molecular biology on biotechnology is considerable as this technique allows the design of structure and the function of proteins. And we have seen for our work this is essential. Biotechnology is a crossover technology affecting a great number of disciplines and industries which contribute to the prosperity of Switzerland. So it is also in the future important that we try to put a lot of effort in this discipline. And the collaboration between the public research organizations and industry is multifaceted. As I showed you at one example, uh, from a short-term cooperation uh, to a strategic alliance. And last but not least, biotechnology might differentiate into a miniaturized and uh, domesticated applications. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, it's uh, very interesting to, to go into the praxis of biotechnology, and you succeeded very well in demonstrating it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.